Hi everyone, uh, my name is Brian Walker. Uh, I created Brogue um, and I was brainstorming ideas for a talk. Uh, I wrote out a long presentation then timed myself and cut half of it. Um, so I hope I cut the right half. Um, I decided to focus on how Brogue tells stories. I think there have been a few presentations that, that, that gestured at this concept, this question of how you generate emergent gameplay, uh, interesting narratives and exciting experiences uh, for characters from procedurally generated elements. Um, and so uh, that, that's the focus of the talk. Uh, and so before we begin, uh, we'll have a little story time. This is the most flattering thing I've read about my game. Uh, this was on the Hitbox team forum, or on, on the development blog, uh, the folks who make Dust Force. So let me read this to you. Uh, there he was, stuck on a wooden bridge over a deep chasm, goblins closing in on both sides, blocking the bridge exits. All he has is an unidentified potion, which he can only hope is a potion of levitation, so he can fly off the bridge to safety. With the goblins just steps away, he drinks the potion. Unfortunately, it was a potion of incineration. A huge burst of flames erupt, setting him, the goblins, and the bridge on fire. The bridge burns away, and everyone falls into the chasm below. Fortunately, he lands safely in a pool of water, which also puts out the flames. Some of the goblins survive, while others hit the ground nearby and die. However, one of the flaming goblins lands in a bog filled with explosive gas and triggers a massive explosion that wipes out the remaining goblins. My friend escapes and continues his journey deeper into the cave. So I think this is a great experience. If every game included a vignette like this, um, I think the roguelike genre would be uh, more popular than, than the big games. Um, and I think uh, th this sort of experience is really an exciting situation. Um, and I, th this is, I think, the core of what the genre can offer. And that, that expression on his face, by the way, is excellent. That is the face of a player who's having fun. <laughs> so if we can chain these uh, exciting situations back to back for an hour on end, and you, you finish your game, and you feel sweat dripping down your back, and you stand up, and you feel like you're emerging from a, a, a different universe, then I think the game designer has done his job well. Um, so what makes an exciting situation? I think there are basically five primary elements. It's got to be a high-stakes situation where failure is uh, very possible, if not the default outcome. Uh, it has to be a situation where the player really wants to win, highly motivated. Uh, it's got to be immersive, so the player sort of identifies with the character instead of uh, feels like she's manipulating a data structure somewhere on a computer. Uh, it has to be meritocratic. Uh, the player has to perceive it as being meritocratic. It's got to be skill that makes the difference, at least for me. Some people like slot machines, but I think uh, it's, 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 it's great to feel like you, you're controlling the outcome. Uh, and it's got to be cognitively interesting to optimize. Um, it's got to be a puzzle that's fun to solve. Um, and I think the biggest risk to the longevity of a game is where the game fails to maintain that sense of interestingness. Uh, where it becomes rote and systematized, where the player immediately knows the answer to every situation. Uh, and here's an example of a game that has been completely solved. This is tic-tac-toe. Um, this tells you if you're X and you're playing first, the red tells you where to play. And then the other squares show you if O plays there, it shows you where to play in that square, and so on. Builds the whole tree out, entire game is solved. Uh, so if you have this a map in your memory, you'll never be entertained by tic-tac-toe again. It's pretty much guaranteed. You'll be totally bored. Um, and the, the, the great and awful thing about the internet age is that you don't even need to spend the time to build this intuition yourself. Um, you can just look it up online. In fact, in the middle of the game, you realize that there's some strategic depth to it. You can just alt-tab over to the wiki, look it up, and you never have to think for yourself. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty... Uh, narrow path that the game designer has to walk, I think, uh, to develop uh, a system that's exciting to solve and frankly also resistant to that sort of uh, data dump download from the internet, from the crowdsourcing. I think uh, we, we had a crawl dev here earlier today uh, who talked about how optimal play should be fun. Um, and I think they, the crawl team in particular has done excellent work in popularizing that notion. I think it's the most important uh, aspect of game design. Um, and I think uh, the sort of metagame elements, alt-tabbing out to a wiki or uh, reading the dominant strategy uh, and then just, you know, playing that strategy, 
um, or every time you find an item in the game, alt tabbing out to see what it does. I think that's also um, an optimal play strategy that's not particularly fun. Um, so we have to cope for, uh, with, with, with the changes to gameplay that, that exists in this internet age. So when you add more content, which is the primary way a game dev tries to keep people from, from getting bored, uh, how do you do it to get the most bang for your buck? Um, and there are two kinds of content, really, that you can add in a, in a roguelike game. Uh, there's content that goes toward character advancement. So this is the items you can find, the skills you can use, the points that you can invest in, uh, the skill tree, uh, and so on, the, the things that build your character's power and abilities. And then there's the environment. And this is the, the whom of the who and whom dichotomy. This is what your character is using his abilities on to overcome the obstacles. So taking those in order, um, how do you add character advancement content to make your character interesting? And also, d despite the pressure that the existence of the internet puts on the game designer. Uh, so one approach is to create a bunch of character classes. Um, and I think it's a valid approach. It certainly, particularly for a roguelike that has to inherit a legacy audience that's used to a diversity of, of play styles, I think this is a great way to cater to people who want to play different kinds of games within one game. Um, I think if you're starting from scratch, if you have the luxury of starting with a blank slate like I did when I, when I built Brogue, um, I think there are a few issues choosing that as a means of making the game's longevity as, as long as possible. Um, by default, there's going to be one class that's just more powerful than all the others, unless by a miracle of game design you manage to, to perfectly balance them. Um, and even if you do, there's probably one dominant build within each class. I know when I played Diablo II decades ago, um, I just looked up the best build for the Sorceress, and then I just built it. And so all of that other content was wasted for me. Um, and so that, that, that is the optimal play. That's how the optimal player plays. Uh, they, if, if they really want to win, and I think to get a player really invested in a game, they, they do need to really want to win, uh, they just look it up online. So adding classes, like new classes, is probably not the way that you maximize the number of hours of fun uh, per unit of content. So Brogue system, I think, I'm not sure that uh, I know of any other games that had a system quite like this, um, but the idea is that it's improvised item-based advancement. So first, the metaphor. Instead of character skills, there are skill items that you find in the dungeon. These are weapons, armor, staffs, charms, rings. Uh, these are things that are reusable. Um, they become your character's abilities. Uh, you can use them over and over again throughout your adventure, uh, and they help your character throughout your adventure. They're not disposable. And then instead of skill points, uh, which is a pretty common RPG trope, uh, you have basically skill point items, uh, which in Brogue's case are scrolls of enchantment that are found throughout the dungeon. And each time you use one of those, and you can only use each one once, uh, it permanently improves one of your skill items. So your weapons become stronger and hit more often. Uh, your armor uh, becomes less burdensome and more protective. Uh, your staffs have more uh, charge to them and the effects are more powerful. Uh, your charms recharge faster and the effects are more powerful. And uh, the, the effects of the rings also become more powerful. Um, and then when you generate those skill point items, it, it might look random to the player, but it's very carefully controlled the rate at which they're spawned, so that every player has basically the same number of points at basically the same rate. So that's the metaphor. Um, it's basically just translating the traditional uh, character-based development into items. Uh, there are a few advantages. Well, well I, I guess, and, and that you use those items to build synergies, um, and, and what you come out with looks a lot like traditional character classes. Uh, so, for example, if you want to build a fire mage character, you can find a staff of fire bolt uh, and some items to keep the, the staff topped off uh, so it doesn't run out of charge. Or a berserker can have an axe, uh, armor that sort of helps them in a crowd, and transference that, uh, like a vampiric effect, so they can regenerate health when they, when they hit. And it's a very potent combination, and in a, in a sea of enemies, that, that character build will just mow them down. Uh, you could build an assassin with a ring of stealth, uh, an escape item to get away, uh, and then a big heavy uh, weapon to deal killing blows whenever there's an opportunity to do a stealth attack. So you can see how even though it's purely item-based uh, character advancement, you can still come up with uh, builds that look a lot like traditional RPGs. 
but the key is that these builds aren't built into the game. There's no line of code that, that refers to a fire mage or distinguishes a fire mage from a berserker. These are sort of improvised character classes. You, uh, you look at the items that are available and cobble one of these together for yourself. Um, so the fact that you only find a subset of these skills per game means that you really, it, it's, it's tough to, uh, to systematize too rigidly. Um, you only find a subset. You don't necessarily know what you're going to find. Uh, there are some special rooms that let you choose any one item from a, a set of items, which can help you uh, have some, uh, some choice over what sort of a build you come out with. Uh, but it, it doesn't give you free reign. You have to be able to be flexible. Um, and you also have to start committing to a build before you know what items are going to be available in the dungeon, uh, because the difficulty ramps up pretty quickly, and you need to start committing to a build to overcome those challenges. Uh, even while you're waiting for, for more items to appear. Uh, and then finally, there's you know, a limited pool of disposable <laughs> items, uh, wild card items, I call them, uh, like uh, you know, scrolls of teleportation are the classic example from Rogue, uh, to let you escape from uh, situations that, um, uh, that are um, beyond your abilities. Um, great. Uh, so I think the key uh, features of that system are forced improvisation and imperfect information. Uh, so the fact that we, um, we, we decouple the advancement from combat, which means that a whole diversity of character builds are encouraged, including character builds that are all about avoiding conflict with monsters. There's no experience points from fighting monsters anymore. Um, and uh, it, it, it really... Uh, lets you build alternative types of builds that are not just about killing monsters. Uh, th th this kind of scheme uh, really rewards like trickery and resourcefulness, scheming and being a scoundrel. And I think that's a good feature because that's a feature that the player themselves can have. Um, if you're playing a really strong warrior character and the, the, um, the, the strength of the character is just in being really strong or really good with an ax, that's not really a skill that the player can identify with. That's not a skill that most of us have, um, or those of you who might have it. You don't really express it by like poking at a keyboard. Um, <laughs> but being devious is something that you can express by poking at a keyboard. So I think there's a kind of identity of the character's um, uh, strength and the player's skill uh, that, that kind of um, gives rise to a little bit of extra immersion. Um, and then the, the other advantage here is that every dungeon uh, allows subtly different character types. Um, you know, uh, it, it's hard to say going in what kinds of characters will be available. And the build strategies are going to be very rich and contingent on the facts. And that means that it's really hard to just alt-tab over to a wiki and look up the dominant strategy for any particular game. Uh, you really have to build the intuition. You have to have played a lot of games. And it's, it's really resistant to spoilers. Um, so then, when designing these kinds of content, um, I think a, a really good rule of thumb is that you want to make them as in, intense and powerful as possible. Um, and normally, you would shy away from that because a really powerful player ability is just going to overpower the game and make it not challenging. Um, and the argument there is instead of balancing power by dialing it back down, balance it with situationality. So come up with really powerful techniques that can only be used in certain circumstances. Uh, and then you don't have to worry how powerful they get. You can turn them all the way up to the maximum. And uh, the, these, these uh, effects and interactions are what differentiates one character from another or one situation from another. So the more you turn up the power of that ability, the more you encourage an optimal player to take advantage of them, and the more different that particular character feels from previous games. Uh, so it's a technique of, of encouraging the game to tell different stories every time you play it, instead of feeling like you're, you're playing the same game over and over. Um, so some examples of, of really powerful effects that are balanced by situationality. Uh, spider webs, uh, when a creature or player is entangled in them, uh, every hit attack hits them. Uh, I, I think in the early days of the game, I used to apply like a minus four modifier here and another minus four modifier there. I realized that you could just turn it up all the way and just make it 100% auto hit. Um, and it, it only makes them more interesting. There's even an, a, a trap in the dungeon that lets you generate these uh, spider webs whenever you throw something at it or touch it. 
So you can use these over and over. You can lure monsters into them and slaughter them. Um, but it's only useful if the spider webs are available. And it's only useful for monsters that were hard to hit in the first place. So it's, it, the, the power of it is balanced by that situationality. Uh, lava is another great example. Instant death for any creature that enters it, unless the creature is flying or fire immune. And there are a whole bunch of different abilities that you can use to either trick, coax, or push monsters into lava. And a lot of these abilities you can use over and over again. Uh, entrancement stabs, uh, you can just, uh, you can build your whole, whole character around that item. Every time you see a lava pit, that's the opportunity to just slaughter as many monsters uh, as you can bring over there. But you've got to bring them over there and you've got to find the lava in the first place. And you're likely to get cornered while you're away from the lava, uh, which creates, I think, an interesting character narrative. Um, negation on magic themed monsters, similar. Uh, instant death for certain monsters that are magic themed, uh, such as uh, summon spectral blades or golems, uh, but it's only effective on certain monsters. Axe weapons uh, hits every surrounding enemy. Um, I think a lot of games have kind of struggled to, to decide how to make weapons feel distinct, and I think the, the, the right answer is to just make them as distinct as possible, to make them as different from one another as possible. Don't just hit the three monsters in front and only if there's no doorway in the way. Just hit every monster around you. Uh, it doesn't make the fight any less challenging than if it were a one-on-one -on -one fight, uh, and it won't be an advantage if it is a one-on-one -on -one fight, so it's still situationally balanced. So that's how to uh, design character abilities and character classes. I think the other piece is making the space itself interesting. And it took me a while to realize this, but I think the key is to come up with combinatorially overlapping zones with qualitatively different advantages and disadvantages. So in other words, a bunch of different zones with a whole bunch of different kinds of advantages and penalties. And then you just overlay them in such a way that you get every conceivable permutation on every level of the dungeon. So as just a quick aside in terms of how to structure the space of the dungeon, grids are great. I think uh, you sometimes see uh, gamers moving toward hex-based grids or lamenting the fact that on a grid, uh, a diagonal movement takes you farther in Euclidean terms, even though you still only use one, one movement point. I think it's great. The fact that diagonals take you farther actually increases the, the strategic interest of the space. Uh, it means that for any pair of points, there's probably a lot of different paths between those points that take the same number of moves. And then when you layer on soft constraints throughout the dungeon, it makes the challenge of picking which of those paths you take much more interesting. Uh, and just one side note, there is like an element of Euclideanness anyway. Um, so for example, uh, there, there's this mechanism of gas diffusion in Brogue. Uh, where uh, each tile has a certain uh, amount of gas in it, and every turn it diffuses. And the diffusion formula is simple. It just averages the gas quantities of itself and its, its eight neighbors every turn from the previous turn. And you can see that even though diagonal uh, points, uh, diagonal moves still count for one movement point, you still end up with a round space after the gas is diffused for a couple turns. Um, so it's not as simple as saying, uh, Th th there is an element of, of Euclideanness sort of hidden underneath the grid, uh, which comes out in, in, in especially in, in combinatorial uh, situations. Uh, so anyway, back to the importance of making the space interesting. I think rich terrain uh, is uh, one of the really key elements. Uh, I think for some reason, I don't know why this is, but I would argue that terrain is just fundamentally more interesting than monsters. And I would say if you think about movies, uh, like really professionally designed plots, uh, like Indiana Jones or the classic dungeon crawl movies, most of their encounters are with terrain elements, like spikes and traps and tripwires and altars and floods and burning vegetation, and many fewer with monsters. Um, I, I don't know exactly why that is, but I think it's, it's worth reflecting on. And I, it, even in some movies where there are monsters in these dungeon crawls, I think it's interesting how often uh, terrain is used uh, as a plot device to, to resolve the conflict with the monster. Um, so I think part of it is that it's just fundamentally creates a sense of space that appeals to us on a, on a, on a basic level. Um, so on the, the, uh, the image here, um, you have a rogue standing on a bridge over a chasm watching grass burn in the distance. 
um, I think it's an evocative kind of uh, situation, uh, an interesting space to be placed into, much more than a bunch of twisty passages all alike. Um, it's also self-explanatory. If you see a patch of dry grass, you probably know what it does. You probably understand that it burns. Uh, whereas if you see like a goblin shaman, like maybe it does some sort of magic, maybe it pokes or stabs or shoots, but it's not as clear. It's not as obvious. Uh, terrain is also a lot easier to make plans around. Um, and the plans are more satisfying. So that lets the player sort of concoct more convoluted plans, more MacGyver moments, if you will, uh, and watch them come to fruition, which is a really satisfying kind of emergent narrative. Uh, so in this case, for example, uh, the player threw an incendiary dart, lit the grass on fire, and the fire is spreading toward the acid mound. Um, kind of a cool uh, way to resolve that challenge, um, very much like something you'd see in a, in a movie about a dungeon crawl. Um, and uh, as compared with making plans around monsters themselves, so getting monsters to fight one another, you know, it, it's a way to make plans and watch them come to fruition, but it's also just kind of like you're standing out of the way while the monsters fight it out, which is maybe not as exciting as setting up this Rube, Rube Goldberg machine of terrain uh, and watching it do your bidding. Um, and I think one particular mechanic that's, that's useful in a variety of different places is terrain spreading over other terrain. Uh, and this is used to make fire spread, to make bridges collapse, to make walkways extend, lakes recede, vegetation grow, tunnels appear in walls, and obstructions melt away. And that was just, th there may even be other examples, but it's a very, very common uh, 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 effect. And I think it makes the terrain feel really alive and dynamic. So that's terrain. Uh, other ways to impose interesting zones of influence and, and sort of uh, combinatorially overlapping advantages and disadvantages on the game space uh, um, are, here are some examples. So, um, and, and I think chess is a testament to how deep uh, gameplay can get with just that technique. Uh, the only thing that chess pieces do differently from one another is how they move and attack. They create little zones of influence and zones of jeopardy. And it's just the interlocking of those different shapes that gives rise to all the complexity of chess. Uh, so some examples of zones. Uh, certain monsters are constrained to particular terrain. You can have monsters that are water bound. You can have, as in this image, you can have some monsters that can't cross chasms and others that can. The little lowercase f's, oh, it's probably pretty hard to see. Uh, but there's a chasm here and the f's are flying up to meet him uh, while the h is kind of stranded on the other side of the chasm. Uh, you can have effects that depend on line of sight. Uh, you can have effects that affect everyone within field of view. Uh, you can have weapons that can uh, attack from a distance, but only vertically, horizontally, or diagonally, or some subset of those. Uh, area of effect attacks, where you know what the shape of the effect will be, uh, and you have to get the monsters into the right orientation so that it affects them all without affecting anyone you don't want it to affect. Uh, you can have effects that depend on the light level of the area. You can have monsters that avoid choke points, which make choke points uh, more interesting as a, as a, as a level feature. Um, and you can have the intensity of those effects increase as you go farther in the dungeon, because the players are probably more powerful uh, and better able to, equip, uh, to respond to, to, uh, to threatening situations. So in a nutshell, um, that's uh, how we tell procedural stories in Brogue. Uh, so you have a bunch of zones, uh, and then that means that a path through that space tells a story. Uh, if you have very high intensity effects from those zones, that makes the story exciting. If you have lots of different types of zones, types of zones that feel qualitatively different, um, that makes the situation often very novel uh, and doesn't feel like the same situation that you encounter with each character. Uh, if the zones are really dense and they're interlocking, uh, then just the simple uh, path of a uh, simple process of finding the optimal path through that space is like narratively interesting, um, sort of a cognitively interesting task. And if you have characters who have improvised character builds uh, built with limited budget of wild cards uh, and imperfect information, then that means you have a, an arc of character development that's unique to the game. And the path that that character will choose through those zones depends on the build that the character has. So it, the story is really. Um, kind of co-authored between the player's choices and the environment created by the dungeon. And then uh, with macros and in-game info to help the player move quickly between situations, uh, it really lets the player focus on the story and not get bogged down 
in alt tabbing or pudding farming uh, or any number of other uh, maybe less exciting tasks. Um, so that was my best attempt to sort of boil down uh, the secrets of uh, what, what I think of as procedural story generation in roguelikes. Um, and I think I do actually have a little extra time, uh, so I'm happy to take questions if anyone would like to ask. That's a good question. The question is what I tried that didn't work in the game. Um, so I guess a few, ex one early example. So I have this monster right now, a zombie, that creates an aura of noxious gas. And uh, it's an interesting effect because once you're affected by it, it creates a status effect that causes you to periodically, forgive me, it's a little distasteful, it causes you to vomit. Um, and you, you lose turns maybe every other time that you move while you're under this effect, and it's random. Um, Originally, out of, um, I guess, maybe I got caught, too caught up in the metaphor, I had to decrease your, your food clock every time you vomited, um, which was, I mean, a very rich metaphor, maybe a little too rich for polite company, um, but the problem was that the food clock really served a really important purpose, and uh, that mechanism broke it. Um, so I think it's good to like let go of the metaphor when there's a gameplay reason to do so. Um, let me give that some more thought. I'll come back to you if I think of anything else. Yes? So I, I like what you say about you know, your, your mechanisms not being there's an optimal build, but there's still an optimal strategy. It just means that the, the guy has to up its game and become interactive and say, well, if you, if you got this first, then you know, probably you know, this is how you play it, and sometimes it won't work out. Yep. Have, have you seen that sort of thing? Absolutely. So the question was, um, th is it possible that guides can just adapt to this new method of character development and just offer richer advice as to how to advance instead of a sort of cookie cutter approach? And yes, absolutely. Um, there is a Brogue wiki. Um, I'm happy that it exists. I don't consider it an enemy by any means. Um, but I think there is sort of a competition that goes on between the game and sort of metagame elements that you want to keep the players away from. Um, and I don't think that competition will ever, ever be like one. Um, but I think you can kind of tip the balance a little bit. I think having uh, a richer and more contingent uh, strategy space uh, tips the odds in the game's favor, favor and makes it somewhat less likely that the player will sort of like emerge from the game to go look up some strategy advice and then return to the game uh, because it's probably somewhat less helpful than in a circumstance where uh, you can just look up a build strategy and mechanically follow it in every game. Uh, but you're absolutely right. I think it, it's all a matter of degree, and it's a matter of like gently pushing back against these alternatives, even if even if the battle will never be decisively won. Yes. Um, so uh, you mentioned kind of this combinatorial interaction, which I think Rogue does a great job with. My question is, how do you make these sorts of interactions or effects discoverable? So, for example, it might take a new player a long time to figure out that there's these treasure rooms and kind of how they work, or figure out some of them more. Like the fire stuff. Is That's a great question. The question is how you make these terrain effects uh, discoverable to the player. Um, I think, uh, so I, 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 I mentioned immersion at one point in the presentation, didn't talk a lot about it. Um, there's a line on the screen, it's very precious screen real estate because there's only like 30 or something vertical lines on the screen that does nothing but show flavor text. So whenever you step on terrain, it's always telling you what the character sees or hears or feels. And I think the, the trick is to like weave clues into that. Um, when you move the mouse around the screen or use the keyboard to move your cursor around, it describes whatever the cursor is over. Um, and so if, if you see a glyph for the first time, you can always you know, mouse over it or, or cursor over it to see what it does. And if you write that flavor text skillfully, um, jury's out whether I've done that, but that's the goal, uh, you can kind of give clues as to what the function of that terrain is. And I think some of it, over time, players will come to figure out as things start exploding. Um, uh, and, but hopefully, for the really powerful effects, you can give them a clue before it explodes on them. Yeah. 
Any other questions? I thought I saw another hand. Okay, thank you very much.